All right, there we go. It's official. Good job. <clears throat> we'll see how. I guess Kathy, I it's good to meet you. Claims when they happen. Now we all know the best way to prevent a claim from ever happening is through safety. That's why we're all here today at today's safety council meeting. So we just want to remind all of you that Shakely is a comprehensive risk management company and not just a workers' comp solutions company. We all know safety and workers' comp go hand in hand. Now it's also important to remember, and you can change the slide, Deb. that safety first. So we never know when a cat is packed with explosives. So yes, just look at this picture. Um, it's okay to smile on, a, on an early Tuesday morning. Uh, it's also remember safety first, slide Deb, because you never know uh, when you might just drop that cameraman by the King Cobra. Um, so these are comical, uh, but we've all seen really crazy things in the workplace. So safety first. Um, so how do we help a business stay safe? Slide, Deb. We do it through three ways, prevention, compliance, and safety staffing. Slide, Deb. Thank you. So with prevention, Shapely's done a lot of drug-free safety program training with the chamber. Uh, that's a resource we have available to clients and members. Employee education is so important. We also do on-site mock OSHA audits, whether that's for a construction business manufacturing or industry, any other industry that wants a neutral set of eyes to come on site that's not OSHA. And of course, monthly webinars. Next slide, please. Compliance. Some of you know that the DOT is a whole nother world of compliance in of its own. So whether that's the authority forms or having to register with um, the clearinghouse, anyone that has a CDL driver now, supervisors have to go, do, go through this 6060 drug and alcohol training. So Shakely helps with that policy development as well. Next slide, please. We're also in the world of safety staffing. We talked to a client yesterday that needs someone on site that can work a tripod in case something happens and need to go down into a well. So Shakely can place certain professionals on the job site if and when they're needed, whether that's attempt to hire a person or even direct employment. Next slide, Deb, thank you. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. For you clients, thank you so much for your business and stay safe out there. Thank you. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, glad you're able to pop in for a bit this morning. Um, and then let's just go through some housekeeping stuff at the slides. I did always, I'm always gonna be mentioning on my steering, steering committee members, or not mine, but the council steering committee members, um, and just what a great job they do and how they pull together and we can put this program on and and work through everything, especially since, uh, you know, the last year or so hasn't been normal. So I really appreciate them. And then um, we did want to share some news about a uh, past steering committee member. Many of you knew Sharon K Karen Schindeldecker. She was a longtime uh, member of our steering committee and an amazing person who's going to be missed a lot. She was tragically um, died in a car accident a few weeks ago. Her husband, Rick, was also in the car, but he is in stable condition. Um, we are going to be sending condolences and flowers to the family. And um, you, can let, you can find their, uh, I'll share a link to the, her obituary page um, with the rest of the information from today. So rest in peace, Karen. Just a reminder, we're doing attendance and tenants incentive. So you could win $100 today just for being here. Um, we will do the grand prize drawing in June and I'll announce the winner when I send out the information from the meeting. This is one big change that's going to be happening and I actually did it for this meeting. Um, I'm just going to register everybody ahead of time. So your name will already be in there. There won't be any, any issues with accessing the meeting the day of in case you forgot to register. So you should just automatically get a thing that says you're um, registered for the Zoom meeting each month and um, you'll be able to get there from that. Again, if anybody has any questions about any of that, just let me know. And these are just, this is a slide that's been in here since uh, July, but these are all the 
ongoing changes or things that um, are different than they normally had been. Again, in October, um, BWC is doing a mega meeting and that's on the 6th at 11 o'clock. And the topic is leading from your heart. It sounds like it's gonna be a really neat, uh, neat program. And um, this is gonna be via a Teams meeting. And I will share that link with you um, at some point in the future, but before then. I also wanna point out we are um, partnering with the North, sorry, Safety Council of Northwest Ohio. Um, he was actually our, one of the trainers there was our speaker uh, for our July meeting. And they are coming down to Lima at the Ohio Means Jobs facility. And they're going to be offering the week-long training for the certified occupational safety training specialist. So um, I have more information on that. It'll also be in the newsletter that goes out um, after the meeting with the information in it. Um, if you want more information, they do have a website. You can go there and find out all the information. I'll also send that along um, separately. So we're really excited to bring that opportunity to our area because they're usually up towards Toledo. Again, just this is our schedule from here um, till January. Oops, sorry. Okay, let me skip one. And now we have Dean. Dean, would you like to take a minute to give us some BWC update? Sure, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, BWC is going to continue doing our hybrid outreach in a way we come out to uh, businesses. So this morning, we actually have a uh, So You Had a Claim Now What webinar coming on. Next month, we have Life Cycle of a Claim, Fire, Oh Wait, Not Another Drill. And one that should appeal to a lot of you is congratulations, your new safety coordinator. Now what? I've I wish I had that safety wand that would impart all this safety knowledge on you when you got that position, um, but I haven't found that on sale anywhere. As Karen, as uh, Deb mentioned, we have a mega, the mega meeting coming up in October, and we're welcoming back Stephanie McLeod as our administrator. Uh, the second one of those mega meetings will be in April next year, April 13th. So we have that scheduled, so you can know those are coming up also. Uh, right now, the, the safety staff and the field staff at BWC are primarily involved with two priority outreaches, a priority outreach and a daily outreach. So we are uh, being sent the daily claim. So you might be getting a phone call or an email from us uh, quicker than you would in the past. So we can reach out and try to help you with those workplace uh, accidents and see what we can do to prevent a reoccurrence. Uh, we're still not going out in the field as much yet. Uh, the priority outreach is where you are looking at those claims drivers that are driving the entire manual number, not just an individual company. Uh, so we're uh, being judicious in uh, which facilities we go out on site on. Um, we are limiting those to one a week. And what that does is it also prevents us from spreading anything that we might come in contact with. So hopefully that'll change sometime in the near future. Um, I can tell you all 120 field staff I wish that was sooner than later, uh, but we will uh, do as directed and we will do what we can virtually uh, until that time we can come back on site uh, to assist each of you. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact any of us as you normally would, and we will do our best to uh, meet your safety needs in a virtual environment. Uh, and we'll continue that until uh, time changes. Thank you all, good morning. Thanks, Dean. And now we wanna move on to the uh, main speaker for this morning's meeting. And um, she's gonna be talking to us about mental health and safety in the workplace. And her name is Katie Tombaugh. She is um, the founder and CEO of Wellness Collective, um, which is a women owned business. So it's headquartered in Westerville. Um, they, have they work with people nationwide and transform lives. And she can tell you more about, she's actually spoke at Safety Congress um, many times and that's how we heard about her to invite her to speak to our group. So I will turn stuff over to her. Great, good morning everybody. That was a lovely introduction. Um, so again, my name is Katie, thank you for having me. A little bit about 
my situation this morning, I'm a working mom, so I'm at home making sure that two little ones get on the bus. <laughs> I'm gonna watch them out the corner of my eye. Um, but I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you about an important topic, mental health. Oh gosh, I could go on and on about mental health and I, I sure will in a moment. I'll just tell you a little bit more about myself and Wellness Collective. I'll set up my screen share and we'll dive right in. Um, so I'm actually from Northwest Ohio, Sylvania, Ohio, and I went to Ohio State University, ended up staying here. So I'm in the Columbus, Ohio area and now officing out of Westerville. Um, I started as a one woman show, but we are now about a team of 30 supporting workplaces nationwide. And so I had a vision to bring health and wellness into the workday. I know that many employers value this and you know, HR has a lot on their plate, safety has a lot on their plate, so I feel good about my work and my team coming in to support health and well being in the workday. And it just so happened that I became involved with the BWC and Safety Congress, and so perhaps there's a chance you've heard me speak before on topics like mindfulness, resiliency, stress mastery, tobacco cessation. Um, so I'm really interested in behavior change. I'm interested in people inside and out, and I find this work really rewarding. Let me go ahead and set up my screen share and just bear with me as I get to the start of the presentation. All right. Just need four. Sorry, my toolbar is not allowing me to go into presentation mode. Well, how about that? I teach on Zoom about 10 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> And wouldn't you know, it's not cooperating. So I'm just going to leave it in this mode for now since it's not allowing me to go full screen. I think if this toolbar will go away, uh, we'll get the view I'm going for. Um, so here we are, mental health safety in the workplace. I have been wanting to get into this space of mental health for a very, very long time. And obviously it requires certain credentials to do it right. And experiencing the pandemic, watching employers and employees navigate the pandemic was really the tipping point I needed to hire the right team to begin this work. And so what I hear is employers and employees asking for more and more support related to mental emotional health. And what I also hear is that there's some confusion or uncertainty maybe about how do we do this? You know, a lot of employers have an employee assistance program, and so they are doing their best to direct people to support and resources and counseling, free counseling through the EAP. But what we find with the EAP, and you can tell me if you disagree, is that utilization is sometimes really, really low. And so I have a theory that utilization is low because when an individual is really at rock bottom, and really mentally, emotionally unwell. They don't necessarily have the bandwidth to get up and shower, <laughs> let alone call all the phone numbers and get the support that they need. Plus there's this stigma associated. Um, so I see two big opportunities. I think there's an opportunity for um, someone like myself to bridge the gap between employer and employee. Because I think with HIPAA and GINA and all the different things we need to consider, it can be a difficult conversation perhaps from employer to employee. Now we're gonna to hope to change that and we'll look at some best practices today. I also hope to bridge the gap to care, right? Because if somebody is in a really dark, difficult place and they can't advocate for themselves, I would like to be able to triage those situations and help people get the care that they need. So um, you'll see here that this was co-created by our mental health specialist and licensed independent social worker, Lara. And she and I are collaborating on all of the content we're creating. Mental health could be a 52 part series. Um, so obviously we can only dive so deep in our time together today. All right, still not letting me go into slideshow mode. So we're just gonna roll with it. All right, let me just make sure I can see here. 
Our learning targets for today, I like to lead with three learning targets. So our first is to understand a term called psychological safety, the risk factors associated and warning signs that may manifest in someone's behavior um, that negatively influence this sense of safety. Uh, our second objective for today is to learn protective factors that employees and the workplace community can apply to foster resiliency. So at the end of the day, learning is great, but the more we can apply the learning, the better. So finally, we'll apply this learning, we'll look at a very specific case study that Lara has for, our, for us um, involving a threat to safety in the workplace and identifying key elements. So I know that I'll have a little bit of support navigating the chat today. Uh, Deb can feed me feedback, questions, comments. I am a firm believer that um, we attend a lot of virtual meetings these days, and so it is more interesting and engaging for everybody involved if you stay active in the chat. So I invite you to do that while I'm speaking. And this can be questions, comments, um, things you agree with, disagree with, clarifications. It's all good. So we are going to kick off our conversation today by looking at psychological safety. Um, we know through evidence that it is essential to workplace productivity, satisfaction, and safety. And safety is our, our hot uh, unifying word, right? We're all here to talk about safety. So what is it? It is the belief that you won't be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. It's the ability to take risks. And as I mentioned, kind of leading up to this chat today, we never know what someone is navigating in their personal life or what they're navigating at home. So if they come to the workplace and it's ideally a safe space to be, but the way they're spoken to, the way the culture is manifesting, they feel beat down, that is only going to compound these risk factors that they already have. And I think we need to be really, really careful because we never know what someone is navigating. There are so many people that are very high functioning and you will not know, you will not know what's really going on. We also know that substance abuse is up. And I have to believe if somebody has a terrible work day and they're talked down to all day long, substance abuse is not going to get any better. Um, so coming back to psychological safety, it's also a shared belief held by team members that others on the team will not embarrass, reject, or punish you for speaking up. I think the simplest way for us to refer to this is diversity of thought. And as I was going through this content with Lara, we were talking about diversity, equity, equality, and inclusion. Really, really important pieces of our culture that employers are talking about more and more and more these days. And so it is just as important that we look at diversity of thought, and again, creating a safe space in that way. So psychological safety does not mean that everyone is nice all the time and always agrees with one another and there's never difficult or uncomfortable situations. In life, I just spoke yesterday on um, kind of the upside of stress and stress as a catalyst for positive change. And what I was speaking about in that session is that there is value in getting uncomfortable because oftentimes when we get uncomfortable and some demand has been placed on us, if we can get through it and use healthy coping and appropriate skills and emotional intelligence, we will get to a better place and we'll be a stronger team and a stronger workplace for it. Um, and I love this last bullet, you know, the team has your back and you have theirs. This is really, really important. All right, so this is a very simple tool that you could use. Um, it's a five question quiz. Does your team have psychological safety? So this is something that you could distribute and share within your workplace. Um, you could encourage leaders to have an authentic conversation about psychological safety. And so just five simple questions here. If I make a mistake on my team, is it often held against me? Are members of my team able to bring up problems and tough issues? Is it safe to take a risk on this team? Is it difficult to ask other members of this team for help? And when working with members of this team, are my unique skills and talents valued and utilized? And this fifth one we know really ties to topics like motivation and engagement. I think engagement is another hot topic that all employers want to support, right? But if people feel that their talents 
um, are dismissed or not leveraged, they can feel bored and frustrated. Um, so I think this is a, a pretty powerful tool that could be implemented. And you might think you know the answer to these questions, but once you look at feedback from a, a group, um, it could be very, very different. So let's look at some risk factors. Uh, risk is something we always want to look at. So these um, are evidence-based and researchers at Simon Fraser University have identified 13 risk factors. These are psychosocial risk factors in the workplace. Um, we know that these impact overall health, um, individual health of employees and the way that work is carried out in the context in which it occurs. And you know, as I'm reading this, I'm just thinking, you know, if someone is distracted, um, by something psychosocial. We know that distraction is not supportive for creating a safe environment. And we already have enough distractions and concerns. So if we can make sure that our culture and how we are interacting with one another is at its best, it, it could be incredibly supportive. So risk factors impacting psychological safety, the 13 of them are listed here. I don't know that I need to, to read them all aloud, but I anticipate some of you might be in transition. You might be in your, your car. I hope you're being safe if you are listening on the go. Um, some of these are probably no surprise that they're on here. Psychological support, organizational culture, clear leadership and expectations. I think a lot of times people are clear as mud and when people are clear as mud, they can be real frustrated. Um, civility and respect, I, I would place this one incredibly high, right? We don't need any type of interpersonal conflict or unsafe situations. Psychological competencies and requirements, growth and development, recognition and reward, involvement and influence, workload management. There are a lot of companies or organizations right now talking about burnout. Um, and it's a, a real concern that the workday is forever changed. Uh, people are over consuming technology. They're going from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. Their workdays are potentially longer and we need to protect people in that way. And then finally, uh, engagement, balance, psychological protection and protection of physical safety. Um, so what do we do with these 13 risk factors? The bottom line is that it's essential that you have policies, obviously, that match what employees need and create an amazing workplace setting that encourages productivity, motivation, safety, and security. Now, I'm going to pause here because that's probably like, well, yeah, obviously. Um, but what I find when I work with organizations and specifically when I work with human resources and leaders, Sometimes these are tough conversations, right? These are, these are actually really big conversations. It's a very big conversation to get all of the leadership together and agree and identify like what are our biggest pain points? What is not working in our culture? Um, where do we need to potentially adopt different policies? Policies I know are a big deal to change. Um, but I think having some guiding principles, I was talking to a mentor of mine and we were like, man, changing workplace culture is really hard. And she recommended guiding principles. You know, what are some things that we can agree upon? Um, you know, everybody has core values, but guiding principles that inform our decision making. You know, what are, what are our commitments or our ground rules for how we're going to show up and interact with one another? I'm in a very sunny space, so hopefully you can still see me. I, I feel a lot of sun on my, on my face here. Um, so warning signs of psychological distress. This is incredibly important. Um, and maybe you've noticed someone in the past. I'll give you an example. You know, I'm self-employed, I'm a small business owner, and I was meeting with a, another group of small business owners, and the woman I was talking to said, I'm really worried about one of my employees. And I said, what's going on? And she said, they haven't changed their clothes for about two weeks. And this was pre-COVID, so they were still going into the office. But she said for two weeks, this individual wore the exact same outfit um, to the office. And so that was a red flag, that something is off. That, that's not a typical behavior. Um, I know in manufacturing and so forth, you have uniforms, so that might be a little trickier to identify. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to look for any change in behavior that is not typical for this individual. 
You know, we get to know our coworkers and we get to know what, what typical behavior looks like. Um, so changes in eating, sleeping, daily functioning, family work, recreational dynamics. So what, what that means, um, dynamics is maybe someone who typically is really easygoing is really on edge and really irritable and really um, reactive. And there's a lot of uh, conflict that's arising out of it. And so what we encourage is if you see something, say something. And the say something part, I think, is really tricky. And so Laura and I were talking about this. I've been chatting with my friends in human resources, my colleagues, and saying, you know, I think that's the trickiest part for people. What, what is it OK to say? Um, and obviously, those who work in human resources have a lot of difficult conversations, or, or as a leader in your organization, you're perhaps experienced in having these difficult conversations. Um, but we just wanted to reiterate some of the things that research has shown us. And that is asking direct questions. Um, asking direct questions increases safety and a sense of connectedness. I think there's a potential fear that by asking someone about something sensitive that it could make things worse. Um, but that's not what the evidence shows. A lot of people who are having a difficult time feel isolated. They feel potentially like if they went away, no one would care or notice. Um, and that's just not true, right? So we want to remind people that they are valued and appreciated and um, that they are not alone, right? Talking about problems lessens the risk of unsafe behavior from occurring. This is really powerful. And we know that a sense of belonging and attachment is critical. So typically when we hear the word attachment, we think of an infant and their, and their parents, right? Healthy attachment at birth. Um, but a sense of belonging is on the hierarchy of human needs. So healthy belonging and attachment and relationships is going to be important for lifelong good health and well-being and psychological safety. So what can I do to support my coworkers? Um, again, tuning in, being aware of normal or typical behavior in your colleagues um, so that you can be alert when a change occurs. And one best practice we wanted to offer up today is taking on the helping role. Um, so this is a philosophy that you could choose to adopt and employ, and it's, it's simple. It's talking about the fact that seeking help is actually a sign of strength and that reaching out to those you're concerned about is also a sign of strength. Again, it can be uncomfortable, but part of our challenge right now is that we don't we don't talk freely still about mental health. You know, I was talking to someone the other day about growing up as a teenager, high school student, college student. We didn't talk about depression. We didn't talk about anxiety. We didn't talk about a lot of the things that fortunately we're talking about now. But again, I think those conversations can be uncomfortable. So we have to start talking about it so that it becomes more comfortable. And again, it can reduce stigma for people who are having a difficult time. And, you know, as I mentioned, men mental health and more specifically mental illness is, is complex. Um, and I sort of think of it as a continuum. You know, there are people that are under distress and there are people that are navigating very distinct diagnosed illnesses. Um, and we need to support everybody, regardless of where they are on that continuum, and ensure that they feel safe um, and, and supported, obviously. Um, so continuing the conversation, what does healthy attachment look like? I love this reminder. Um, it's supporting others and feeling seen. Sometimes people feel, like I said, invisible, and that's... Um, that breaks my heart, right? Because obviously we value all of our team members. Feeling safe, feeling secure, and feeling soothed. Um, and feeling secure, I think, has really been impacted quite a bit by COVID. Um, I know a lot of businesses have been impacted by COVID, so that impacts production. And um, I know because of an industry I touch, um, furloughs. <laughs> and layoffs and big changes, right? And so 
Life is always uncertain, but this uncertainty is compounded by a number of other things that we're navigating. I've also seen a lot of organizations recently going through some pretty big change, you know, potentially being acquired or, um, you know, sold. And, um, and again, I think that's just a lot for everybody to navigate. And when there's added uncertainty, I, because I work with employees all day, I just see how their, their distress just really goes up. Um, so we're going to review quickly five actions for helping. I am hoping that you all can see me because it is so sunny where I am right now. Um, so I might ask you to bear with me one second. Bear with me one second. I'm going to do something to help my um, light situation. One moment. This will be worth the pause. This is Deb. In case anybody has any questions um, or just wants to chat, feel free to pop a message into the chat screen. Okay. All right, I'm back. And hopefully this looks better. I, I can't see myself right now because of the mode that I'm in, but... That is better. Okay, good. I had a feeling that I was like glowing based on the amount of sun coming in this space. Okay, so five action steps for helping. Um, and we talked about using direct language. Are you okay? Are you okay? And I think we forget that the small things are the big things. <laughs> Are you okay? Just caring enough to pause and ask and being direct. Um, obviously, it's our responsibility to keep people safe. So if there is indication that they are not okay, ask if they have a plan to hurt themselves or others. Again, I can see how this would be an incredibly uncomfortable situation um, to flat out ask this. But mental health experts, you know, last week um, was uh, World Suicide Awareness Week and World Suicide Awareness Day. And all of the experts agree that it is important to ask, do you have a plan to hurt yourself? Um, that does not increase the likelihood that someone will commit suicide. This has been studied. It is more important to ask. Um, be there, listen carefully and learn what the other person is thinking and feeling. So I think when we're asking questions and seeking to understand, you know, that looks like open-ended questions. And that also looks like reflecting back what you've heard them say. You know, I heard you say that um, you're feeling upset. I heard you say that, you know, you're navigating something at home and just reflecting back to make sure that you understand what they're saying and you're using their words. Um, help them to connect. So we do have hotlines for crisis situations. I know in the Columbus, Ohio area, we also have like a 24 seven facility uh, for mental health crisis situations where someone can get immediate support. Um, and so we want, we want to support these crisis situations if there's evidence of suicidal or homicidal ideation. Ideation means you're, they're thinking about it and it's been admitted that they're thinking about it. Um, also make a connection with a trusted individual, like a family member, friend, spiritual advisor, or mental health professional. You know, we can make referrals. We can encourage them to lean into these trusted relationships that they already have. Um, and again, someone like myself can help to connect the dots, um, which I think can be really supportive. And then staying connected. Um, so staying in touch after a crisis can make a difference as well. You know, not just referring somebody and not checking back in with them. Um, so from here, let's dig into some preventative factors. So protective, sorry, pr protective factors are characteristics associated with a lower likelihood of a negative outcome. So they're going to help us to get a more positive or desirable outcome. And so with this, we wanted to share uh, these five ways to help create psychological safety in the workplace. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, I think one of the most important things we can do is talk about it. Um, because the more we talk about it, um, the more we are modeling that it's not 
something to be stigmatized or judged, it's okay to talk about it. Um, so making it a priority in discussions. And this needs to start obviously from the top down. You don't need to hear me say that. Um, we need to facilitate everyone speaking up. So there needs to be a forum and a way that these conversations will be facilitated. And that could look really different for a lot of different groups. And um, you know, a lot of workplaces will come to me and say, oh, you know, we don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. Or, you know, I can't take guys and gals and people off the line. Um, I can't stop production to do this. You know, I, I can't interrupt the workday. And I said, okay, I have to believe that training and development, learning and development is a part of your culture and your workday. So this is where we plug this in. You know, if it's important, we're going to make space for it. Um, and I tell you what, it's been my experience that it only takes saving one life for this to be worth it. Uh, number three, establish norms for how failure is handled. Um, gosh, people are so hard on themselves, so hard on themselves. And I see this because with fitness and nutrition, you know, people beat themselves up. So if they're beating themselves up about what they had for lunch that day, can you imagine what they're saying to themselves if they make a mistake at work? Um, so we need to have some protocols for, you know, when there is a mistake or an issue um, or something risky or a failure, you know, how do we have some healthy coaching afterwards? How do we help that person to feel safe and secure? Remember those healthy attachment techniques? Um, because mistakes happen. You know, we do our best to, to mitigate and minimize those, um, but we don't want it to be a tipping point for, for something um, emergent or, or dramatic that, that a person then takes it out on themselves. Um, we want to create space for new ideas. You know, I'm, I'm reading a book right now um, that's incredibly inspiring about the power of ideas. You know, most people are, are fearful or hesitant to take action on new ideas because of risk of failure. Um, but new ideas are where innovation happens, um, where improvement happens. I know continuous improvement is, is really important for a lot of our, our employers. Um, and so new ideas on the table that we can test allows us to experience continuous improvement. Um, embrace, embrace productive conflict. You know, it's uncomfortable. Nobody likes conflict. Um, but the more we experience it um, and get through it, we can potentially come out of it um, with a strengthened relationship um, and a better outcome than avoiding that uncomfortable conversation. So we just have a couple of slides in here. Again, you will receive all of these. Um, we have a couple of slides in here that recap all of the ways that we can create psych psychological safety. Um, and so it's my job to put these on the table. Um, it's my hope that you will take and implement the ones that you're able to. And again, I acknowledge that some of these are really big conversations um, to, to change policy and, and to change leadership's um, approach to things. Um, so again, using the words psychological safety and, and making that um, proclamation that you're going to do um, a better job or, you know, continue to prioritize it, facilitate active listening, encourage people to share their ideas. Um, you know, our, our teams are our biggest assets and we can't read minds, <laughs> so we need people to share with us. Establish norms, again, for failure and how to overcome failures and make sure people feel safe in the process. Um, open to ideas, as we mentioned. Embrace productive conflict. These are our review slides. Um, see curiosity as the key. I think curiosity is really powerful. And we don't, I, I don't hear people talk about this as much, but if we stay curious about how people are doing, if we stay curious about how we can continue to improve and grow, if we stay curious about how we can just continue to improve, um, that's a, a pretty powerful attribute. Um, so we have to talk about how do we foster curiosity? Um, and, and what does that look like? And again, I'm sure each workplace can approach this in their own way. Um, and Lara and I were talking that curiosity is the antidote to judgment. So 
And this is where we started talking about D, E, E, and I, diversity, equity, equality, and inclusion. You know, if we can seek to understand one another better, it will, it will support in removing judgment. Um, and it's a productive alternative to, to blame and, and uh, super healthy. Um, seek other points of view, challenge assumptions, create a culture of experimentation. Um, so I know I'm just about out of time, um, but I'll read this case study quickly. And um, I'd like for you to think about these questions as well. So here's the potential situation. A team member, a mid-level manager, sat down in a team meeting and admitted he was battling a terminal illness. The team member disclosing his illness opened the floodgates for other team members to share their challenges, struggles, and problems. This often makes people uncomfortable. Why? So some food for thought. How does psychological safety play into this scenario? What are potential risk factors for disclosing this information? And what are the potential protective factors or elements that are going to strengthen the team? Um, so I know, I know we have a lot of people on the, on the meeting. We have, I see 60. Um, so feel free to, to sit with this. Um, feel free you know, to let us know if you would like to share or weigh in on this. I think this is a case study that you could take and use as a team building exercise. You know, if this were to happen, let's think through, you know, what, what are the possible scenarios? Um, I think what's, what's interesting about this, and when I read it, what comes up for me is this idea of vulnerability. And if you've read any of the work by uh, sociologist Brene Brown, she talks a lot about vulnerability and the power of vulnerability and that it's actually a desirable attribute in leaders. Um, so it doesn't mean you have to share your deepest, darkest secrets, but it's letting people know like, hey, I'm not okay and I'm navigating something really difficult. And when somebody does that, it creates space for other people to do the same thing and to know that they're not alone and to let empathy um, flourish. Now, potential risk factors, you know, so people could be hesitant to share because it threatens that sense of security, right? Someone might not want to share that they are sick or that they need time away because they're then fearful of losing their job, you know, and when, when people are stressed, thoughts aren't always logical, right? So uh, there can be a lot of anxiety that comes with sharing. You know, so we can work to create a safe space um, to help people say, to help people feel seen, secure, safe, and soothed. Um, and there's some good that can come out of this uncomfortable situation. So we have just a couple more slides here and then we can open it up for discussion. I know we have a hard stop and I wanna allow time for questions and comments. Um, so you'll see here our evidence-based references, um, and these are all toolkits that you could essentially go back and look at. So some, some really solid um, references here. And then just finally, I wanted to let you know that I hope you sense that I'm passionate about this topic and this subject. Um, and if there's something that you would like to talk through, think through offline and continue the conversation, Lara and I both would be happy to, to speak with you. Um, I am active on LinkedIn if you'd like to connect that way as well, but obviously a, a personal email is welcomed. Um, so with that, I'm going to discontinue my screen share. Um, so give me one second here. And the benefit of that is I get to see, <laughs> see what's going on. Uh, Zoom makes it a little difficult to toggle around, so I try to stay in flow. Um, so I am just here to support with any questions, comments. If you guys have any uh, question or comments, please share them in the chat. Wait just a minute or so to see if anything pops up. In the meantime, I do want to remind you guys, we will be drawing for the certificate um, and all this information will be shared after the meeting. 
I learned so much. This was an amazing topic and I think so um, on point for where we're all at these days. And just really keep checked in with your coworkers. Um, not everybody's doing okay out there. We just have to remember that. Um, there's some comments that it was very helpful and that the reminders you gave um, were great. And thinking, I don't, it doesn't look like anybody has um, a lot of comments or questions for you. So, okay. On that note, um, I think I have one more slide. Actually, this might be it. Again, just a reminder um, there'll be an evaluation survey that'll come out. Um, it'll be later this week. And then the next meeting is October 6th, the 11. Please keep safety first and remember your why. And there's my contact information below. Um, Katie, we can't thank you enough for joining us today and giving us some of your time and sharing your expertise and, um, and getting the same information out to people. It's, uh, it's great. Sure thing. So, all right. All right, well, it looks like we're at the end of the meeting. Um, I don't see any more questions popping up, just comments about that it was a great topic, so. Hey Deb, they, there was a question about the timing of receiving oh. the slide content. Oh, okay, it will be later this week. It looks like it's my, yeah, that'll be later this week. I am on vacation, so I'm not gonna take the time it takes to get all that put together today. And if somebody, yeah, if somebody needed it sooner for some reason, they could email me directly and I can send it. It's not perfect. A okay. All right. Awesome. All right, everybody. Well, well, let's wrap this up. Thanks for being here this morning. It was great. Um, great knowing what we're connecting on some level. And um, I will see you at October 6th mega meeting. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Um, let, me know if, let me know if you have any questions. Hopefully a couple of people might reach out. Yeah, sounds good. All right, great. Thanks. Thanks, Dean. I see you still hanging out there. Have a good day, everybody. You too. Have a good day to you too. Thank you.